welcome to The Voice, the only non-singing fake uh, show trying to help you determine whether you've heard from the voice of God or not. Our first contestant on The Voice is Ryan Allworth. Ryan, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Did a stellar job singing this morning. So Ryan's got an interesting story of, of a time in life where he really feels like uh, that, that he heard the voice of God guiding him in his life. And so each week we're going to try to share someone else's story. So as a community, we can kind of see how does God guide and direct us in our lives, right? So Ryan, you were, uh, it was a few years ago, you were traveling the world singing in a great group called Straight No Chaser. You guys were Straight No Chaser, right? Thank and, you, both of you. Yes, yes. Thank all, you. All, all, two, all two of your fans. But you're traveling around the world. And, and so, I, I mean, I, I remember meeting up with you at, at a wedding once when you guys, I was so jealous because, you know, you're basically living my dream, right? Traveling the world, singing, doing all this kind of stuff. But you had a moment where, it, and it was a good life, right? I mean, yeah. making good money every night. You got thousands of people cheering for you. It was great. But you came to a point where realizing that you felt God was moving you in a different direction. You're on a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean somewhere, and you feel like God speaks to us. So, Take us to the cruise ship. Yeah, so that was October 14th of 2012. And since February of 2012, I had been praying, uh, hey, God, I am sensing that my days singing a cappella with Straight No Chaser are numbered. However, I am terrified because I don't know what else I would be doing besides what I'm doing now. Yeah. And who's going to hire a guy who's been singing a cappella music professionally for five years? <laughs> it's a strong it's, resume. It's really not a transferable <laughs> skill at all. <laughs> Um, and so I'm freaking out, which tends to be my thing, you know, when I'm, when I'm concerned about the future, I'm just like, what am I going to be doing? Ah." Um, and so I had been praying since February and in September of 2012, I was off the road for a month and I had found out, uh, through a friend that young life, which is a global, uh, Christian ministry for high school kids, uh, was starting up in Fishers. Now, Lauren and I had volunteered with young life a decade prior. And so when I heard about that, it was like bells and whistles were going off, Mm. Uh, and, and, and God was almost like, Hey, pay attention, listen. And so I asked my friend some questions and learned some more and, uh, went back home to Lauren and I'm like, Hey, young life is back and they need a staff person. I think I'm going to pray about this, but I think this might be what God wants to move us out of and into. So, so one thing I don't want to miss here is like, you're going to tell a story where there's like a clim- like a climactic, oh, yeah. like God speaks to you in this like cabin of a cruise ship. But what you're saying is there was like, there was months of, of, of the voice, like some sensing that God was doing something. So it wasn't just this moment. There was a, it was an ongoing kind of thing. Right. Yeah. I I was sensing that things were, um, just a little off. Things were somewhat amiss and, um, just conversations that Lauren and I would had, you know, as, as the guys were talking about where the group is headed, I'm just like, I just don't think I'm going to be in that much longer. But again, Mm. I I internalized everything and just anxiety just bred and bred and bred Mm. and went through the roof. And so um, there was a lot of fear in that season of life. Again, like, what am I going to go into? Then I find out about the opportunity. Now it's October 14th, 2012, and I am going to tell my nine best friends, hey, uh, this upcoming tour that we've got is going to be my last, and I'm going to come home and lead Young Life in Fishers. Yeah. And I had no idea how they were going to take it. I didn't know what the ramifications were going to be, all that. Um, So I'm in the cruise ship alone, and I'm in this moment of prayer. And again, I'm freaking out. And uh, this overwhelming peace just comes over me. Hmm. And uh, I didn't hear it with my ears, but I heard and sensed and felt um, this still small whisper that spoke, I am with you. Just four words. I am with you. Hmm. And um, later that night after our show, I told the guys that I would be leaving. And there were 13 total people in the room backstage. And I could have sworn as I started to just speak, hey, this is going to be my last tour. It was like a 14th presence just showed up. Yeah. And so that was, um, that was my first instance with, with God's real, like internal voice. Yeah. Again, not audible, but internal. Hmm. Seven months later, so July of 2013, I'm now, I've been on staff for a while with Young Life, and I get a call um, on a Sunday to go out to this one driveway in Geist, and uh, the text message read, hey, something has happened. You need to be out here. And so I show up at this driveway where there's 10 young women uh, who are headed to a concert that night, and that evening, um, the, the body of their friend, one of their best friends who had been missing for three days, mm. uh, had been found in Geist Reservoir. And uh, Peyton had taken her life, and, and that, uh, that moment was, in my opinion, like a critical moment of I am, I call them I am with you moments. Hmm. Because I got out of my car, and I show up in this scenario where I don't know a soul, 
and I'm just like, God, you, I, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. Yeah. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Again, I'm kind of like, you got to be with me. Yeah. And so um, just walking into that, the moment their circle uh, opened by one to let me in, into their pain, into their story, into their confusion, I realized, okay, God, you know what you're doing. Just give me the words to say. Yeah. Give me the, uh, the thing that you want me to, to share with these friends. So. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was an amazing moment of just the the reminder. Hey, I was in I was with you in the cruise ship cabin. I was yeah. with you backstage. Now I'm with you again. Yeah, Ryan, I I think you heard the voice, and I want you to be on my team. Yes, <laughs> I accept. <laughs> awesome, Darren. The hair looks great, man. You Keep know, it up. I, I try hard. I try hard. Thanks, Ryan. Anyway. If, uh, if you want to hear more of Ryan's story, we just recorded a podcast actually this week uh, for another episode of the Born to Be podcast. If you check that on iTunes, where we talk a little bit more about this. And then uh, actually, we, there's Ryan has a whole episode for the Born to Be podcast that you could download just talking about that story and, and much more in his life. And uh, great guy. You can also hear him on Radio Theology, 99.5 ZPL, every Sunday morning from 7 to 10 a.m. <laughs> Hashtag plug. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the reason we're doing this series is Josh and I were talking a few months ago. And I said, Josh, I'm still bothered by a Sunday that, that, uh, from probably six years ago. We're at the old building for Mercy Road. If, you guys, if you're new to Mercy Road, we used to have a, a, a really dinky building, like down on 106 in college. And during, I, I preached one week, and, and we had, after the service, uh, I kind of closed it with like five minutes of, of silence, of just a, a moment to really kind of try to hear the voice of God. And after that um, morning, I got a call from a friend who said that, They were with someone who, in that moment, really wanted to hear something from God. And they sat there for five minutes, and they heard nothing and no sense of anything. And and it was a really negative moment that marked their life, where basically, like, what they felt was that they weren't good enough or that they didn't have enough faith to hear something. And it, it was a real negative thing for me. And it really broke my heart because I realized that for so many of us, we really would love to hear the voice of God. And most of us, most people that I talk to, they say, I don't think God really ever speaks to me. But what I want us to do for the next three weeks is come to terms with this, first and foremost. I've never met anybody. I'm not saying that they don't exist, but I've never met anyone that has actually audibly heard the voice of God. But yet in church, we talk about it and say stuff like, the voice of God. Like I heard this from God, the voice of God, but you didn't, you didn't actually hear a voice. It's like what Ryan was saying is he sensed something with his, with all of his being that this is what God was saying, but he didn't hear anything. So I want to start by saying you may never, ever actually hear an audible voice from God, but God is speaking. And so I want us to get our mind around the fact that, that God is speaking to you and, and, and it doesn't have to do with how good you are or, or, or if you have enough faith. It has everything to do with how good he is and how gracious he is and how big he is. So hopefully for the next three weeks we can, we can delve into this and it'll move you along a little bit uh, further in your understanding of how God is leading and guiding and directing your life, okay? So Jesus, thanks for this day. Thanks for this moment. As we jump into your word, I pray that uh, you would guide and direct us, uh, that you would help me to communicate clearly and succinctly, and uh, that, that we would hear from you this morning. Rest us in Jesus' name. Amen. So I believe that God desires to communicate to you, and I believe God has designed you to communicate with him. Okay? A couple questions I want us to ask, though, is could God speak to you? Like, let's start there. Because if we're saying that God speaks, let's, let's deal with it. Could God speak to you? Well, I think he could. The word of God says that God spoke the, wor- the world into existence, right? So it seems like he communicates. If he's actually alive, right, and, and, and desires connection, it's at least plausible that he could speak to you. We have all of these stories in the Bible of thousands of years of people who God spoke to, okay? So it's possible God could speak to you. Here's another question, is would God speak to you? Like, would he? If he could, would he? And I think he would if he's alive and if he's loving and if he actually desires to be in your life, I think he could and I think he would speak to you. And if he would, what would he use? I think he would use words to communicate to us. 
Okay? Kind of makes sense. And if you look at the word, word, and what is it defined as, when we speak to each other, we use words, okay? And a word is defined as an expression of the mind and the heart of a person. So you have expressions of your mind and your heart, and you put them together in these things called words, and we give them to each other to communicate. I believe that God desires to communicate to you, to take what is on his mind and his heart and actually give it to you so that you would know him better, know your purpose within him better, and be guided and directed to live life as it was created to be lived. We see this from the beginning, right? Adam and Eve, when they were created, that's that's the the, the image and, and the way it was supposed to function is that they were in a relationship and connected with God, and it seems like they communicated together. So God could, and I think he would communicate to us. I was interviewing a guy named Wayne Jacobson this week for another episode of our Born to Be podcast, and uh, I don't know if you know Wayne. He helped write uh, the book The Shack and a couple other books, and he has a great uh, podcast called The God Journey. And Wayne said he was asked recently... Somebody said, Wayne, do you really believe that you're good enough for God to speak to you every day? And Wayne said, you know, I think you're actually asking the wrong question. I don't think the question is, do I think I'm good enough to hear from God every day? I think the question is, is God good enough? And is God big enough? And is God gracious enough to speak to us every day? And as a baseline thought, I, I, I truly believe that God could and God would and God does desire to speak and communicate and guide and direct us every day and in very everyday kind of ways. And if we don't start from that as a presupposition of of our thoughts and and of where we are, we're probably not going to make much progress in our connection with God if we don't actually think he could and he would. And here's why I think he would. I think it's because this is a God who really desires a relationship with us. That's the goal. He invites us into a covenant relationship. The word covenant means becoming one. I believe that God wants to invite us into a covenant relationship where we are one with him. And that's his agenda for your life. Not just to be an advice vending machine for you, right? But to actually enjoy relationship where he imparts to us his mind and his heart and his emotions that we would know his will and we would follow him and this is what jesus says how this is going to kind of function right in john chapter 10 and we've spent some time in this chapter the past couple months so it should be somewhat familiar to you okay i'm not going to read the whole thing but this is what jesus says how this connection would work that he would could and that he actually does want to guide and speak to us so in john chapter 10 jesus says this let me set this before you as plainly as possible If a person climbs over or through the fence of a sheep pen instead of going through the gate, you know he's up to no good. A sheep rustler. The shepherd walks right up to the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate to him and the sheep recognize his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he gets them all out, he leads them and they follow because they're familiar with his voice. They won't follow a stranger's voice but will scatter because they aren't used to the sound of it. Now, the image here, right, is basically uh, shepherds would, a lot of times, a lot of flocks would spend evenings together in big sheep pens. A lot of times, like kind of a a hollowed out kind of cave area. And people say one of the craziest things to watch is in the morning when the different shepherds would come to get their flocks, they would stand there and begin to call their sheep. They were all intermixed together. But the most amazing things to see is as the different shepherds are calling out to their sheep, that the sheep actually come out of the pen and know which shepherd to follow. And I think it's interesting that Jesus used this, this, this illustration of, of how our connection with him works. Like, why did he use this illustration of sheep? I think one is because he was talking to people who he wanted to communicate with, and they understood sheep in shepherd culture, right? So we always have to remember, if we're reading the Bible, we always read it over the shoulder of the people it was first written to. To know that Jesus was communicating about this because he wanted to communicate to people so they would understand his mind and emotions, correct? So he's using something they would understand. He's also actually using something that makes a lot of sense because we as human beings are a lot like sheep, all right? Here's the deal with sheep. They're not very smart, okay? And they will basically follow anything, anywhere to any kind of negative demise of their life. 
In fact, basically, a sheep will just get in line and follow even the sound of a bell. Have you ever heard of the leadership principle, a bell sheep principle? Basically, in leadership, the, the, the principle there is that you find like your best performing uh, employee or whatever it is, and, and you celebrate, basically put a bell on that employee, and then everyone else will follow their great behavior and their action, right? It's a leadership principle. It comes from actually the fact that shepherds, the, the sheep that was the best at listening to their voice and actually following, they'd put a, a bell on that sheep. And so as it walked, it was like ding, dong, ding, right? And all the rest of the sheep would just be like, I guess we'll just follow the bell, right? I mean, they're just not very bright. Neither are we. Think about your life. Think about some of the biggest mistakes you've made. I wonder if you weren't following someone or something, some kind of bell sheep in your life that you didn't really think through it. You just kind of got somewhere. Jesus understands that we're pretty defenseless and we're not that smart. And a lot of times we follow people we shouldn't to things we shouldn't to places we shouldn't be to our own demise. And so he says, listen, I'm a good shepherd. In fact, I lay down my life for the sheep. But for you to live life and live it to the full, it's going to be a life where you live dependent on this relationship together where you hear my voice, you recognize my voice, and I will lead you. So there's a lot at stake in this. And it's one of the reasons I'm I'm really passionate about this series because I'm I'm kind of amazed by how many of us just don't really have a concept that God is working and moving in your life. So I'm hoping that something that I say today, and Eric says next week, and then me the next week, that you walk away with a little bit more understanding of what this looks like to have this kind of connection. I um, I was reading a a book a couple years ago uh, about Bono from uh, U2, and uh, tickets go on sale tomorrow at 10 o'clock, just so everybody knows. You're going to make sure you get those. (laughs) And if anybody wants to go to the concert on Friday night in Louisville, talk to me. I'm trying to get rid of two tickets. But anyway, okay, coming back to this. Um, so Bono's talking about his relationship with God in this book. And he says this. He's talking to his father. And his father says, you do seem to have a relationship with God. And I said, didn't you ever have one? And he said, no. And I said, but you have been a Catholic for most of your life. And his dad said, yeah, lots of people are Catholic. It's a one-way conversation. But you seem to hear something back from the silence. And I said, that's true, I do. And he said, how do you feel it? And I said, I hear it in some sort of instinctive way. I feel a response to a prayer, or I feel led in a direction. Or if I'm studying the scriptures, they become alive in an odd way, and they make sense to the moment I'm in. They're no longer a historical document. And he was mind blown by this. I think for some of us to think about actually having that type of a relationship with Jesus is mind-blowing to us. And I think there may be three reasons of that real quick. I think some of us is we're afraid of God. We're afraid that we would have that kind of connection with God. And we're afraid of the kind of things he might start saying to us because we think he's mad at us. And he probably just wants to to ruin our life or he's going to take away all of our fun. Whatever it may be, we're afraid. And at least we're in good company, right? Because basically, since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, all of humanity has been afraid of connection with God. The great part about the Bible, though, is it is just story after story after story of thousands of years of God trying to prove to us, his creation, you don't have to be scared of me. I love you, right? He's communicated again, again, and again, and again. In fact, every time, basically, any any divinity or angel or whatever shows up to speak to human beings with the first thing they say don't be afraid right so some of us are afraid i think some of us we we don't have a connection the kind of relationship like that with god is because we're just too arrogant like we don't want god to be really in our life telling us what to do like thank you very much i'll run my own life god why don't you just like keep the sun in the sky and i'll take care of my life and just try not to screw up my deal right that's some of us. Some of us are afraid. Some of us are too arrogant. I think some of us are just seeking advice. Like we don't actually want a relationship with God. We just want advice from him. And I was reading a book, another book that I, I love. It's a book called um, Hearing God, written by Dallas Willard. If you're looking for a book on prayer, maybe to read this summer, grab Hearing God. I think you really enjoy it. He says this, I fear people seek to hear God solely as a device for securing their own safety, comfort, and righteousness. I tell you, just to be real honest, when I read that for the first time, 
that he fears that many people seek to hear God solely as a device for securing their own safety, comfort, and righteousness. The first time I read it, you know what I thought? It's embarrassing. Here's what I thought. I think that's all I ever asked God for. Like there's more than just me? He continues, he says, my extreme preoccupation with knowing God's will for me may only indicate, contrary to what is often thought, that I am over-concerned with myself, not a Christ-like interest in the well-being of others or in the glory of God. I said in the first service that I think if God offered an advice text service, like if right now if I were like, listen, just text advice to like 22645, and God will sign you up for a morning advice text. I bet every one of us would sign up for it. Like, listen, God, if at 8 o'clock in the morning, if you could just hit me up with, like, my God advice for the day, like, do this, don't do this, stop doing that, call that person. Like, I think we would all sign up. Like, no relationship with him. If, God, if you could just text me the advice for the day, that'd be cool. And all of us say, like, oh, you know, that actually would be pretty cool. Darren, I'll take that. But let's take that thought and put it in regular human relationship terms. What if you got married and your spouse was like, here's the deal. We won't be spending any time together, dear. What's going to happen is at 8 o'clock in the morning, I'll send you a text of the stuff you should do and just go ahead and stick with the text. Well, we thought maybe we could hang out a little bit. And we could go to dinner, a couple of dates. No, no dates. There'll be no dinners. No. 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 We're, we're not going to have a relationship. I'm just going to send you a text of what you need to do for the day. Like, none of us would choose that. Like, what if your friends treated you like that? Hey, you want to hang out? No, I'm, I'll just text you some advice. So when we think about it in earthly relationships, it's comical. But we all just thought when I said the God thing a minute ago, I'd probably take it. And God's saying, hey, this is so much bigger than just here's some advice for your life. Like I could and I would and I do speak to you because I want us to enjoy a relationship where life becomes so much more than just getting advice from God. I'm actually living my life, as, as, as it says in Second Peter, participating in the divine nature and being guided and directed by the word of God, by the will of God, by the spirit of God through life. Okay, so that's what God does. So how does he do it? Let's go real quick through some, some basic three ways that this works. Okay, three ways that God most basically communicates is through the written word of God, through, through life circumstances, and through the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, what we call gentle nudges of the Spirit. So it starts with the written word of God. This is not that fun, okay? But here's the deal. The written word of God is the Bible. And if we want to be guided by the word of God, we actually have to read the Bible, right? Or listen to it, something, Okay? And I'm amazed at how many of us, we just don't ever read the Bible. We don't have any Bible knowledge of anything. And then we, keep, when then we say stuff like, I just know no, God doesn't speak to me. Let me memorize this with me, okay? If I want to know what God is saying, I have to know what God has said. Okay? Say it with me. If I want to know what God is saying, I have to know what God has said. And most of us have almost zero knowledge of what God has said. And when we get in the word of God, we don't get into it to actually hear from God. Sometimes we just do it because we kind of feel guilty and we think we should. No, no. You're getting into the word of God so you understand what God has said, his character, who he is, the way he's interacted with. And what, what I want to challenge you to do is to begin reading the word of God this month and, and, and begin to actively listen to the word of God. And I'm borrowing this from counseling. I do a little bit of, of, of premarital counseling, not a ton. And, and, uh, but then even last year, my wife and I were going through some counseling, and our counselor made us start to, to redo this. But it's just an act of listening. Has anybody ever done act of listening in counseling before? Anybody? Okay, here's how this works, right? It's basically you just repeat back to the person the thing that they just said to you to make sure that you were listening well. You should try it this week because what you realize is you're probably a terrible listener, right? You're just thinking about what you're getting ready to say as they're talking. But here's how this works, right? Somebody says to you like, hey, I'm a little frustrated with you because you're not helping around the house much. 
and you would actively listen, you would say, so what I'm hearing you say is that you're a little frustrated because I don't help around the house much. Is that right? And the person would say, yes. And you would go, thank you. That's the, that's the, that's the way that, that it works, which is basically just you're learning to listen and not respond or, or attack or whatever. But we need to do this because a lot of times what happens is we don't hear what the person's actually saying. We hear what we want to hear. So the person says, hey, I'm a little frustrated because you're not helping around the house much. And what we sometimes hear is, you think I'm a terrible person and I have no value and you hate me. And then a lot of times we respond to what we heard, not what they said. And we say, well, let me tell you how, why you're a terrible person, right? And it's like, it's like, what happened? And we don't communicate. What if, what if we read the Bible for a month? And we said, if this is what God has said, if the Bible is what God has said, he might be saying this to me, and you actively listen. It would look like this. You would read a passage of scripture that talks about your character or about your identity in Christ or about God's character, about who he is. Maybe you read something that says, like, therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. What if you stopped and said, so God, what I'm hearing you say is that there's no condemnation for those that are us that are in Christ Jesus. What if you read somewhere that says, like, like, therefore, anyone in Christ is a new creation, and, and the old is, is gone, and the new has come. What if you stopped and said, okay, God, what I'm hearing you say is that I'm a new creation in you, that the old is gone, and the new has come. See, if you would begin to actively listen to the word of God, I promise you, promise you, that in the next month, if you did this, there would be a life circumstance in your life where the word of God that you have begun to actively listen to would be brought up by the Holy Spirit and you would go, wow, God is speaking to me through what he has already said. And I've actively listened to this and received it as truth. It's what happens when we're singing. Today, when I, I'm going to finish speaking here in a few minutes, you're going to sing a song about the fact that you are a child of God. That is not just the way we feel the the last seven minutes of our time together so we can go home, right? That time of worship is we are actually speaking what God has said is true about us and singing it back to him, okay? So if you want to know if God has spoken to you, God's going to speak to you in about six minutes when you stand up and actively listen and say back to him what he's already said is true about us. And that is how God begins to speak to us. He also does it through life circumstances. And here's the deal. With a lot of life circumstances, what we get caught up is asking the wrong question here. Something happens in your life and we get caught up demanding that God answer the question, why is this happening? God, tell me why this is happening. I demand a reason. Why, 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 why? And guess what we get? Silence. I have found silence. So much more success in my life when life circumstances come that I don't understand asking the question, God, what do you want me to learn? What are you saying to me in the midst of this moment, God? And then getting alone, Eric's going to talk about this next week, to choose solitude, silence, and begin to observe and reflect upon what's going on inside of me in these moments and say, God, what do I need to know? Let me get into your word. Let me actively listen here and see what God might be saying to me. The last thing is a still small voice, the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that when he gets them out, he leads them and they follow because they're familiar with his voice and they won't follow a stranger, but will scatter because they aren't used to the sound of it. You see, guys, as intimacy grows, so does familiarity. Like, think about your mom or your husband or wife, somebody that's really close to you. Like, when they call you, do they have to be like, hey, it's me, your mom, right? Like, if your husband or wife calls, they don't usually say, hey, honey, it's me, your wife, <laughs> right? Like, you know. Like, even in our times, like, do you, have you ever had, like, a friend get, like, like, somebody grabs their phone and sends you a text message? Have you ever seen it where you even know somebody so well that even if somebody, it's not them, sends a text message from their phone, you're like, I don't think they sent this, right? Like, we can interpret text message tone even in our times. We need to get to the place of that where we're so familiar with God's mind and his heart that we know his voice in our life. 
You may say, how, how does that work? Well, just think how easy it is for us to sometimes hear the devil's voice in our mind. Like, I can interpret temptation pretty well in my life. Like, oh, where did that thought come from? Oh, I don't think it was Jesus, right? As intimacy grows, so does familiarity. So as we grow in that relationship, we see it. I'm going to close with a story for me as how, how, how all the three of these came together. And as the band comes up, we're going to close uh, with a time of, of singing back to God what is true about us. But I was at Indiana West University going to college. It was uh, a few years ago. And uh, I was there. I'd moved from Arizona, and I was chasing a dream I'd had since I was in third grade. I wanted to be in a band and play drums and travel around the nation. And, and I thought that was what God had called me to, and, and I was doing it. We had a band, and we were traveling around telling people about Jesus, and I was living my dream. And I was happy with God because he was giving me the life I wanted. And um, then uh, in a matter of weeks, we found out that one of the guys in our band was a compulsive liar and a thief, and he'd stole a bunch of money for us, and our ministry went. And this dream that I had been pursuing for my whole life was now a heap of useless pain in my life. And I was really mad at God, and I wanted to know why this had happened. And it's winter in Indiana, which is terrible. And uh, I'd only been living here for four years, so I hadn't adjusted yet to seasonal change. Because in Arizona, we have summer and brown. That's all you get. And here, we had all these. So uh, the night before God spoke to me, I was reading in the Word. And I read the passage in John where Jesus is teaching. And he's basically foreshadowing communion and his death and everything. But he says something really wacky. He tells these people, if you won't eat my flesh or drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. And everybody freaks out. And they're like, this dude's crazy. He's a cannibal. <laughs> We're out of here, right? And it says tons of these the disciples leave, tons of people. And he says, he looks at the disciples and he says to them, he says, do you want to leave too? And Peter looks at him and he says, where are we to go? We believe that you are the Holy One of God and you have the words of eternal life. I read that. The next day, I'm walking across the parking lot, leaving some class, and it's sleeting. And I hate it. Like, snow's cool and pretty and rain's okay, but sleet is basically needles from the devil, I think. Like, just being... <laughs> so it's sleeting, and I'm recounting to God why I'm mad about him ruining my life. And this is, I was doing this all for you, and it's sleeting. And, rah, 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 rah. and like Ryan said, I didn't hear it, but with all of my being, I heard him ask me this question. Do you want to leave too? And as I'm walking across the parking lot, I just start to cry. And at least now my tears are melting the icicles on my face, right? And I say back to God the words of Peter. And I said, well, where am I going to go? Because I really believe that you're the Holy One of God. And you have the words of eternal life. And I knew it was God speaking to me because he had already said it. So I knew he was saying it. And here's the deal. This is the crazy part. You may not like this, but it's how it works. Notice that God didn't tell Ryan and God didn't tell me in that moment. He didn't tell me why that was happening in my life. He didn't tell me what to do. There was no advice given at all. But what was given is an invitation to trust, and to step into deeper relationship. You may not understand. You're not going to get all the advice you want, but will you choose the relationship? And that moment I did, and I can tell you now it's been years and years and years of choosing to say yes and to lean into the relationship and getting better at hearing his voice. But here's the deal. I'll be honest with you. I'm not in a great place right now spiritually. And the reason is because I'm too busy and I'm not taking time for the relationship. I've been following God for over 30 years. It's a long time, right? And there's seasons where I'm really in tune and just hearing his voice and enjoying those times with him. But my personality, what I get doing is I get going a thousand miles an hour and then I just tell God to catch up and maybe scream in the window every once in a while. And God is usually operate like that. He likes us to be silent, to slow down, to be still and know that he's God. So I was talking to a buddy the other day and he said, you know what I figured out in my life is that I do pretty good in sprints. And I was like, tell me about that. And he said, well... I can eat healthy and I can have time with God and I can do all the stuff I really want to do if I give myself small sprints to do that. Like, I can't think about it like, I'm going to be healthy all the way till December and spend time with God every day. He's like, but I can do about four weeks. So he said, I'm doing a spiritual sprint right now. I thought, I can do that. 
And so here's what I'm doing, and you can join me if you want. Maybe you're in a really dry place, or maybe you've never really heard God's voice and you really want this kind of relationship. Maybe join me in this four-week sprint, just through the month of June. I'm getting up early just to spend time with God. I'm journaling, fasting one day a week. Right? I'm eating healthy. Because when God says to love him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, we're all integrated. And every time that I'm actually physically disciplined, it's amazing how spiritually I'm in tune. Okay? So maybe, maybe for you, it's a month of a spiritual sprint to lean in to hear the voice of God. We'll see where we're at in four weeks.